The meaning of any word is defined by its usage. So without having enough information about its usage, you can't properly define its meaning. But what religion has done is to take a meaning of a word and put it into the text where it isn't. And this is a process called eisegesis, which is reading into the text what isn't there. So what religion does is to take a word and apply a meaning to it and then read the text as though that's what it means. And this is a problem because if you were to simply let the text determine what the usage of the words being used are, you would come to a different conclusion. But what religion likes to do is to take a meaning of a word and put it into the text and then say, you know, you're twisting what the scripture says if you say it says something else because look here it says obey but it's brought in a false meaning or a false understanding of a word and many of the words have been distorted over time because of a history of tyranny so we had the roman empire and then that was mantle was taken up by the roman catholic church roman catholic church and throughout the Middle Ages, we had tyrannical kings who said that if all powers are appointed by God, then my appointment as king was appointed by God. And therefore, me ruling as king is something God has determined. And to oppose me, then, therefore, is to oppose God. So shut up and do what you're told. Bow down and worship me. Or else. And this is the kind of filter of tyranny that words have gone through, is this history of tyranny. So because of this history, the usage of words has been distorted. And then taking this process and thinking, well, this word means this, and this word means this, and this word means this, and read a sentence in the Bible and you come up with a wrong interpretation because you're putting the meaning into the word before reading the text rather than as a result of meaning of reading the text instead of letting the usage of the words in the text determine the meaning you're putting the meaning there and then determining what you think the text says based on having inserted meaning that can be kind of confusing the way that that's presented because I'm not giving an illustration at the moment. But, for example, the word cleave can mean to cling together and it can also mean to split apart. And cleave is the root of words like cleft and cloven. And so, if a man cleaves to his wife and leaves father and mother, then we can interpret from the usage that is contrasting against leaving father and mother, so it probably means cling together, that a man clings to his wife. But if you are hidden in the cleft of the rock, then you are probably hidden in a part where the rock was split apart, not a place where the rock is clinging together, because you probably wouldn't fit there. So we can interpret that in that case, cleft is referring to splitting apart. And you could also take a piece of text that just says, it's bad. And you wouldn't know what that means. But if I said, it's bad, you would have an interpretation. You would have some more information based on the way that it's said. Where I could say, it's bad. And you would have a different interpretation. There could also be more information given by more words being used. We have a combination of the way that we communicate where words are actually not how we think because we think in pictures, sounds, and physical sensations. And then we use words in order to attempt to convey that from our brain and our experience to someone else.
and it's kind of an ineffective way of communicating which is why sometimes we feel like something like music is a better tool of communication and it's why we have these kinds of artistic endeavors because there are ways of attempting to express these thoughts through something other than through verbal communication and so what happens is that we interpret all kinds of data based on feelings sounds and sights and actually the process of reading is relatively new especially as it pertains to being a common form of communication because it's actually kind of unnatural for us to write things down and read it but it's a good mechanism especially without the technology we have today of like I'm making a video and I'm recording it and you can listen to me speak as I do it and I give a presentation and some people even have other physical demonstrations of what they're doing and so we have the means to do this now but in earlier times the only thing that you had was to try and write something down and I'm convinced too that one of the things that has happened was that I think that they they kinda were just note-taking I think it's one of the reasons why you read the Gospels and think like there's really not a lot of description there I think what they were doing was they were basically doing the Cliff Notes version of some, of things. They were writing down what they were able to remember, the, the notes in order to be able to remember what to present. Just like I have a pad here with the notes of what I want to talk about, but I don't have this, re I'm not reading a full-on speech that I wrote word for word. I'm just putting down what's going to trigger me about what I want to talk about. And so I think that's one of the things that, going back, there's a lack of description. And it was still mostly a verbal thing that it was presented so that people, because they weren't literate. And so you would have a person who knew how to write and a person who knew how to read, and you would have people know, giving the presentation. And it would be unusual to have somebody just say you know here read this and you know good luck with interpreting what it means and yet it was a good thing that the authority of the Pope as infallible was rejected in favor of saying you know here's what the text says read it for yourself but the problem is that we don't know what that says I mean you can read it and then say, what does that mean? And that's when you start interpreting and putting meanings into words that aren't there. And you say, you know, what does this word mean? And someone tells you what it means. And you say, what does this word mean? And someone tells you what it means. And then you read the sentence and you say, okay, so God demands that we shut up and do what we're told or else. And that's not what it says. So it's a big problem. And we've run everything through a filter of this history of tyranny and God is not a tyrant so we have all kinds of words that are in the Bible and I made up just in a few minutes off the top of my head a list that was over 24 words more than two dozen words just in a few minutes off the top of my head that religion has defined incorrectly as it pertains to its actual usage in the text and it's not like that's the wrong definition of those words in certain cases, but it's the wrong definition of those words in the placement in the text where it's being used as a proof text to tell you, here's what God demands of you. And so the filter of tyranny has distorted our word usage. And we run these words that are in the Bible through a filter of tyranny and legalism. So we have very legalistic definitions of words as well as these concepts of tyranny 
and we've applied them to God as though God was one of these unjust rulers that demanded an oath of fealty that put their foot on the throat of their people and said, bow down to me and shut up and do what you're told or else. And so we've said that if Jesus is Lord, he must look like these people who are our lords over us. Even though Jesus said that the Gentiles exercise lordship, but I rule by serving. And he said, I'm not the one sitting at the table. I'm the one serving the one sitting at the table. So God is the servant of all. And there was something called an atonement theory. And an atonement theory is, as a broad generalization, an attempt to explain what is the importance of the humanity, divinity, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And in the Middle Ages, there was someone named Anselm who said that depending on who the victim of the transgression is, that's what determines the penalty. And so there would be one penalty for committing a crime against the peasant, against a fellow peasant, and there would be another crime for committing a, uh, another penalty for committing a crime against the lord of the land, and that would probably be death, and perhaps greater than death, like such as death to you and your entire family, plus I'm taking your land, and good riddance to you. And so that's the kind of image of God that the tyranny filter has presented, is that God is this intolerant, sovereign tyrant who demands an oath of fealty and puts his foot on your throat and demands that you serve him, even though God is not served by hands as though he needed anything. But this is the kind of theory that was presented the beginning of the theory that was presented by Anselm was that since God is the highest authority of all, and since God is eternal, then therefore the penalty for transgressing God must be one that is eternal. And therefore, the only atonement that can be made for such a transgression would have to be a perfect sacrifice. And that's where that particular idea came from of Jesus having to be a perfect sacrifice to atone for sins against a God who is eternal and therefore the penalty is eternal. And that's persisted through to today as part of the atonement theory of what it was that Jesus did, what was accomplished by his death on the cross. I don't subscribe to those kinds of theories. I think what Jesus did was demonstrate the nature and the character of the Father. And one of the things that he demonstrated was that he was unwilling to take retribution. He was unwilling to exact revenge. He was unwilling to resort to violence. He was unwilling to reign in lordship over anyone, but was servant of all. So I think what he was saying is that he who has seen me has seen the Father, means that that is the type of person God is. That is the nature and character of what the Father is, is to be servant of all, and to be loving, and to be unwilling to exact revenge. In fact, Peter denied him, and when Jesus rose and returned to Peter, he not only restored him emotionally and spiritually, but he affirmed his leadership role in the church when he said to feed my sheep. So he affirmed his continuing role in leadership. There was no revenge taken. There was restoration instead. But the tyranny filter tells us to define justice as returning harm for harm. And we have this idea that God can't just forgive sin. And just contained within that by itself is the idea that forgiveness is an injustice. Because if God can't just forgive sin, but must punish the one who commits the crime with a penalty of death, then that means it's not forgiveness, it's retribution. And forgiveness is an injustice. Then we have the idea of mercy as being to withhold the penalty that is prescribed 
and that would therefore be make that therefore mercy would be an injustice as well if that's the correct definition of mercy and it's not but that's what we get told we get told mercy is not getting what you deserve which if you have anything that define is defined and uses the word deserve you need to throw it out all automatically because deserve is such a subjective term you can say that you deserve something but what is the prescription that tells you what's deserved or not because deserved is subjective earned is not if I earn a wage and it says here's how much you earn per hour or here's the agreed upon rate then you have something that you can point to and say that's how I can determine what is earned or not it was this many hours at this rate of pay this is the wage that's what was earned. Deserved is far more subjective than that. Deserved is you do something and you say, well, I think this is what I deserve. And somebody else says, well, no, I don't think that's what you deserve at all. So it's entirely subjective. It's a terrible word to base any principle on. And so if you have any concept or definition of anything that includes the word deserved, it, al it already needs to be thrown out just for having the word deserved in it. And probably what people really mean is earned, but they're pointing to the wrong things as far as how they even determine what that means. So the t tyrannical idea of justice is to return harm for harm. And so since it would be unjust to leave a harm unreturned, and since God is the ultimate authority, then the harm returned must be perpetual, eternal, and never-ending. And I don't even really ascribe to an atonement theory per se, because all atonement theories really start with the idea is that God is dissatisfied and he doesn't like you and you need to do something for God and you need to do something in order for God to find you acceptable. And so most of them say, here's the part that Jesus did in order to work toward that end. And then here now here's the part that you need to do to seal the deal and to finish the process. And I don't agree with the concept that God is dissatisfied at all. I think that's how you discern the difference between God and the devil is that the devil says, if you're the son of God, then prove it. And God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So the word of God affirms you're his son or daughter. The word of God affirms that he's pleased with you. And the word of God affirms that you are beloved. The word of God says that you're a treasure and you're a pearl. And it says that greater love, there is no greater love than that a man lay down his life for his friends and that you are his friends and that he's willing to give all in order to have you. But religion tells you that God doesn't really love you. He finds you completely unsatisfactory to begin with. But he's willing to pull the wool over his own eyes as you put on an Esau skin suit and he'll pretend that you're somebody you're not. He'll pretend that you're Jesus who he loves because it would be absolutely abhorrent to him to find you to be well-pleasing in his sight. He can only find Jesus to be well-pleasing in his sight. So we have the Esau skin suit. And God pulls the wool over his own eyes and he says, You sound like Jacob, but you feel like my beloved Esau. Ah, you sound like you. Oh, <coughs> oh I'm trying to restrain the vomit. But you feel like my beloved Jesus in whom I'm well pleased. Ah, oh, Jesus, come to me. So we have this idea, it's twisted. It says, God doesn't like you, but he's willing to pretend that you're not you. And we have this idea of justification. And people will say, you know, justification is to be in right standing with God. So the first thing is that you're not in right standing with God. And then you need to get justified. And so you need to be made acceptable in his sight. And then you've got sanctification, which is where... Now that he's pretending that you're not abhorrent to him, he's going to 
help you to continually be a little less abhorrent over time until finally you'll die and he'll transform you into something that you're not so that you can stop being abhorrent to him. And then that's glorification. And that's the typical model that religion uses to say, God doesn't like you. He hates everything about you. He can't stand what you do. And eventually, finally, if you come close enough to trying hard enough, when you die, he'll transform you into something he likes. That's satanic. That's satanic. Justified doesn't mean when God pretends that you are not what you are and says, okay, I will accept you to be in the presence of my sight. Justify means to be brought into alignment. And so if you open up your word processor, Microsoft Word or LibreOffice Writer or whatever on your computer, and there's going to be a button and it's going to say, left justify, center justify, right justify. And so every word on the page will be aligned to the left, perfectly down the center, or over to the right. And justify means alignment. So to be justified with God means to be brought into alignment with God and with the Word of God. And the Word of God is, this is my beloved son or daughter in whom I am well pleased. That's what you come into alignment with, is recognizing that God is thoroughly pleased with his workmanship. And you can have whatever disagreements you want with God over time, and that's going to happen. And you're going to say, no, this can't possibly be right. And God's going to say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Who told you that that was wrong with you? Who told you that that was a problem? And it's going to be because it wasn't me. And so, sanctification is to know that you're clean. Sanctification is the process by which you say, okay, I don't feel like that's true about me. But that's what God says about me. And so, the more I fix upon the fact that that's what God says about me, the more I come into alignment with believing that that's what God says about me, and so that's what I see about me. And that's what God says about you, and so that's what I see about you. And so my value for myself and others comes into alignment with the fact that we are all one family under one Father, in one body and one spirit. And that all things are by him, to him, and through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And he said, this is good when he finished it and rested. He said, this is very good. And he never reversed that. He did not say, Adam, you ate from the tree I told you not to. My creation is no longer very good. He never reversed the fact that he proclaimed it was very good. And so glorification is when you fully embraced that. And you so let your light shine before men that they see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. It's when you become the beacon, when you become the thing that leads people to the fact that God is good and that the goodness of God leads people to that mind change. And that mind change is the justification. And so you then become that beacon to another's justification and then progressively to their sanctification and then continuing to their glorification. It doesn't mean God pretends that you're somebody you're not and then he, tries start, he starts the process of transforming you into something that you're not and then when you die, he finishes the process of transforming you into something that you're not at no point ever accepting you as being the thing that he made you to be. And that would be like, can you, you know, because, oh, because free will. That would be like Samsung making an inferior cell phone that doesn't match up to their standards. Like, 
and, and I'm saying like, okay, we have a standard here, but we're going to make the phone at a lesser standard because we want the phone to exercise free will to determine whether it wants to be a better phone than it is. That'd be stupid. That would be utterly ridiculous. The phone can't by itself decide what it wants, what kind of standard it wants to live up to. It's going to be what it was made to be. You're, you are what you were made to be. And you could be, you could want to be something different, but that's not going to do anything about it. And if God was dissatisfied, can you imagine Samsung making a phone that doesn't meet their standards and saying, well, none of these phones are deciding to be better than what we made them to be. You know, you'd need to scrap that and make something that matches what your ideal is, that matches what your standard is. And if God doesn't like what he created, then he needs to do some, do a better job at making it. It's just sensible. It's logical. But he's not dissatisfied with what he made. We're dissatisfied with what he made. We're dissatisfied with what he made. Get that through. Like, get that through. We're dissatisfied. Not God. And so justification is when we believe the word of God. This is my beloved son and daughter in whom I'm well pleased. When we see that about ourselves and we see that about others, that's to believe the word of God. That's the word of God. And to believe that, that's to come into alignment. That's to put on the mind of Christ. That is to change your mind and believe that the kingdom of God is here and it's now and it's within you and that you are the son or daughter that shines your light and leads others to the goodness of God. But we have a continuing distortion of every concept and every word that is used in the Bible that runs through this filter of tyranny. And we have the definition of grace is Grace is, or no, mercy is not getting the punishment that you deserve, and grace is getting a blessing that you don't deserve. So this is a legalistic definition of mercy, first of all. And it says that mercy is to withhold the prescribed retribution for your transgression. So mercy is not a withheld retribution. If it was that, it would be an injustice. But let's take a look at what mercy really is, because mercy is kindness. Mercy is compassion. Mercy is helping one another. Mercy is comforting the grieving. And we see in Psalms 86, starting in verse 12, it says, I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forevermore. For great is your mercy towards me, and you have delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul, and have not set you before, before them. But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. O turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your handmaid. Show me a, go a token for good that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed because you, Lord, has helped and comforted me. So we can see here what the definition of mercy is. Mercy is to give your strength to your servant. So he's saying for God to give him God's strength would be mercy. And to help and to comfort him is mercy. So mercy is to give strength to another who has no strength and to help them and to comfort them. Mercy is not to withhold a punitive measure for someone violating a rule. That is only the correct definition in legal terms. In legal terms, that's what mercy is. But God is not a legalist. God is not a tyrant. So then we continue to look at what mercy and judgment and justice are. And we go to Zechariah chapter 7. And it says in verse 8, And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus spakes the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the strange, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. 
So to be kind towards others and to express compassion and help for one another, help for the needy, and to comfort those in need and to take care of people is what mercy and true judgment and true justice are. It's not to exact revenge. It's not to return harm for harm. So other words that are messed up is like commandment. We have the idea that a commandment is a demand made under the threat of of punishment. When really what a commandment is, is an instruction. And to obey a commandment is to hear that instruction and to follow that instruction, to do what is instructed. And it's not under the threat of punishment, but because that's how things work. You know, if you're going to bake a cake and there's instructions and you don't follow the instructions, you might not turn out with a good cake. But if you follow the instructions properly and do what the instructions tell you to do, you'll probably turn out with a good cake. So the the p penalty or reward is contained within the item itself and the doing or not doing of the instructions. And law is a teaching. And so when it speaks in the Old Testament of, of you know, meditate on the law, it's taught, it's, it means the instruction. It doesn't mean the the demand under threat of penalty. It's talking about, again, it's talking about instruction. It's talking about guidance. The law is a teaching. Um, it's not a list of do's and don'ts, don'ts that you comply to under a promise of reward and a threat of punishment, but that's what it's, be, that's what it's come to mean. It's come to mean a list of do's and don'ts, and here's the promise of reward if you do, uh, and here's the threat of punishment if you don't. And you are what you do, and we value you based on how well you do it. Confess is another one. Like, So to confess something, you know, if you confess Jesus is Lord, confess actually means to speak in unity. So the, the C-O-N part of it is from the Latin com, which means together, but it's not together like just you know in the same place at the same time but it's it's an intertwining it's it's knit together it's intertwined it's intermingled it's inseparable and fess has to do with speaking so confess is to speak together in unity well if the word of god is this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased then to confess jesus is lord is to come into unity with that word and to speak in unity with that word it's not an admission of guilt. And we have confess, again, a legalistic term, a legalistic filter that it's run through that we say confess means to admit your wrongdoing. So when you confess something, you're admitting your wrongdoing. But really what that is, is it, it comes from the idea, even legalistically, it comes from the idea that you're agreeing to what is said. So they give you a written statement that says, here's what you did. And you sign that written statement and that's your confession because it's an agreement that the written statement is accurate and true. But the written statement is a statement of your wrongdoing. So in a legal term, the written statement is a statement of your wrongdoing and your confession is, is coming into unity, speaking in unity with what that uh, statement of your wrongdoing is. But we've taken that and transferred the usage of the word confess and to mean admit your wrongdoing. Confess what you did. But what is really referring to is speaking in unity. So confess means to speak in unity. And so if you confess the Lord Jesus, what you're doing is you're speaking in unity with what the message of Jesus is. And it's not your filthy, disgusting unlovable, horrible transgressor of the law. But that's that's the filter. That's the tyranny filter and the the uh, filter of what um, religion has taught with these distorted meanings of words. So sin is the transgression of the law. But if there's no law, then there's no transgression. And that's like still have 
the law, but in China where they had the law that you could only have one child. And so if you had more than one child, that would be a transgression of the law. So in religious terms, that would be a sin because that would be a transgression of the law. So to have two children would be a sin. And if you lived in the United States and you have two children, you're not a sinner because you're not under that law. You live in a different kingdom. You don't live under that dominion. That law doesn't apply to you. And in fact, in the United States, if you have enough children, they give you a TV show. So it's not a sin to have two children. It's only a sin to have two children in China because the law said you can only have one. So if there's a law that says no cake on Tuesday, don't eat cake on Tuesday, and you eat cake on Tuesday, then that's a sin. But if they abolish the law and they say, okay, you know, have cake whatever day you want, even if it's Tuesday, then it's not a sin to have cake on Tuesday. So where there is no law, there's no transgression. And if you don't live in that kingdom where that law applies, then it's not a sin. So that's why this whole idea of license to sin should be shut down real easily. It shouldn't take an hour long or 25 minutes or even 15 minutes to, to respond to it. Paul addressed the situation by saying, well, that's a stupid question. You clearly don't even understand the concept because the concept is that a light, okay, a license is the approval to do something that you would otherwise not be approved to do. So the accusation of license to sin first of all, misdefines sin, but then also it's saying now you've got, you're, you're claiming to have a license to do something that other people are not allowed to do. It doesn't take into account an abolishment of the law. You are now allowed to eat cake on Tuesday. So Paul's saying that's, that's ridiculous. You don't even understand the concept. You're not sinning by eating cake on Tuesday. It's not a license to eat cake on Tuesday while everyone else is not allowed to do it. You're not being given a license to do something you'd otherwise not be allowed to do. We've revoked the rule that says you can't do it. So all things are lawful, but not everything is profitable. All things are lawful, but you might be brought under the dominion of it. So you can snort cocaine and God's not mad at you, but it might not work out well for you in life. It might not work out well. It might become a problem. You might not, you might want to reconsider whether that's a good idea, but, and this is another thing. Law is an attempt to control behavior through the threat of punishment and the promise of reward for compliance to the prescribed standard. So there's a rule. And then based on how well you comply to that rule, you're either promised a reward or threatened with a punishment. Then there has to be a whole administration of enforcement of the rule. And what you really have is you have an attempt to get people to do things that they don't want to do and to prevent people from doing things they do want to do. And Grace says that's a terrible way of going about getting people to have the correct end result. So let's say you want people to respect each other's property. My property is mine. It belongs to me. Your property is yours. It belongs to you. So one means you could go about doing it is to create a rule saying you can't steal and here's the penalty if you steal. Another way you could go about it is you could teach people that you have value, he has value, she has value, that stuff is his and it has value to him, that stuff is yours and it has value to you, that stuff is hers and it has value to her, and none of you are lacking for anything. So you don't need to have what you don't ha what what the other person has. And so that's what grace is all about is saying is saying, you know, you don't need to have this mentality of I want what you have and I'm going to take it from you. And the only thing stopping me from taking it from you is that I'm afraid of what pe penalty I might suffer at the hands of doing so. Because then if the enforcement is not adequate or if you can somehow overcome the enforcement or 
you just don't care. The penalty's not severe enough to care. There's all kinds of problems with it. Because what you're trying to do is control behavior at the final destination endpoint. The very last step in the process where a person has already determined, here's how I want to do things, and now you're attempting to stop them. And so God is smarter than that. God doesn't think, you know, God doesn't wait until the very last step in the process of why things have gone astray with your thinking and say, you know, here's the promise of reward and the threat of punishment for compliance. And so if law is the, or sin is the transgression of the law and the law is liberty, so we have the law of liberty, then what is a transgression of the law? The transgression of the law would be to curtail liberty, to prohibit, to create a prohibition. So to go back to a system of law is sin. So again, this concept where you, in, you take the word sin and you insert a meaning into it and you read it and you see sin equals transgression of Ten Commandments. And now you've just jacked up your whole ability to understand the passage because you've inserted a meaning into the word instead of letting the text tell you what the word means. And if you would continue re reading, you would find out what the text is saying is that sin is the building of prohibitions by which when people are non-compliant, you condemn them. And so it's a completely different meaning. Now sin has become the system of prohibition and condemnation instead of violation of the prohibitions. So it's completely inverted the meaning of the word sin. And if you bring to the text the definition of the word sin before you read it, you're going to be jacked up. You're going to have the wrong meaning to the text. And then you're going to point to it and you're going to say, see, there's the word sin. And so you got to let the text tell you what it means because God is not a tyrant. And everything has been run through this filter of tyranny and legalism. And the meaning of words has been distorted and we're not letting the text determine what the meaning is through the usage of it. We're bringing a definition to the word, putting it in the text, reading it, and saying, see, here's what it says. And that's not what it says. So let's take a look at how God's not even a tyrant, because God actually even, it, it's great, because there's even some, some stuff here where you can see that God actually warned against the fact that our kings are not going to rule mercifully like God does. That the rule of man is to exercise lordship over others, but God rules by serving. So first we're going to look at this parable in the book of Judges. And we see that Jotham is speaking and it says, He stood upon stood on the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said to them, Hearken unto me, you men of Sheshem, that God may hearken unto you. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them, and they said to the olive tree, Reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, Should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? And the tree said to the fig tree, Come and reign over us. But the tree said, fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the vine, Come and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheers God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? So here, in each one of these examples, they're saying, I'm not going to ele elevate myself above others and, and rule with lordship over others. There's objection in all these cases is that it would be an injustice to elevate the self above others and reign over them. Then said all the trees to the bramble, come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, if in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So what the brambles said was, sure, I'll rule over you, but you're going to do it my way or you're going to pay the price. It's shut up and do what you're told or pay the price. And so we see in 1 Samuel where there's a demand for a king and he says, you know, 
the kind of king you're going to get is not going to be to your benefit. So it's going to be the whole first uh, first Samuel chapter 8 here. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. And the name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, took bribes, and the pervert, and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, you are old and your sons walk not in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. Okay, so... God reigning over them is going to probably look a little different than what's about to be described. In fact, probably the opposite. But this is going to be a depiction of what tyranny looks like. And God's reign is to rule by serving, therefore is completely different. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto you. Now, therefore, hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them that the manner of the king that shall reign over them. So here's the manner of the king that will reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself for his chariots and to be his horsemen, and some of them shall run before his chariots. He's going he's gonna to put them to war. He's going to take your sons and put them, in, put them to war. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties. And he will set them to ear his ground, to reap his harvest, and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And probably things less reputable than that. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. So he's going to take your property, and he will take a tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your manservants and your maidservants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep, and you shall be his servants. And you shall cry out in that day because of your king, which you, uh, you shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. And so the manner of king that's going to reign over them is going to look like someone exercising lordship and taking whatever he wants for whatever he needs, however he wants, whenever he wants. And that's completely opposite of how God rules. So what we have by contrast is Jesus telling his disciples, how he exercises his dominion, which is completely different than what was just described in First Samuel chapter 8. And they were saying, you know, which one of us gets to sit at your right and your left? And it says, there was a strife among them which should be uh, of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. So they even like that situation. But you shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, uh, you let him as, be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that does serve. For whether is greater he that sits at me or he that serves, is it not he that sits at the table? But I am among you as he that serves. So if God is the image of the nature and character of the Father, and he's the one that serves, not the one that demands service, then what is God like? Is God like those kings that were described in 1 Samuel chapter 8? Is God like religion characterizes him or completely the opposite? It says, You are they which have continued with me in my temptations. Another word that's misrepresented. Temptation always has to do with being a test for the purpose of making accusation. You are they which have continued with me in my tests by which the leadership is trying to make accusation. And I point unto you a kingdom as my father has appointed to me. So what does that kingdom look like? Does it look like the one in 1 Samuel chapter 8? Or does it look like something different? Does it look like the one where he's the one serving the table instead of the one demanding service? 
So what does that kingdom look like? That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit in thrones judging the 12 tribes of, Is of Israel. And they had no idea that those thrones were not like Caesar's throne. Because their idea was that Jesus was going to replace Caesar and sit on the throne and the Romans were going to be uh, put into the position of being the ones being oppressed. But that's not at all what Jesus was suggesting. So how is God's kingdom? What does it look like? In Matthew 13, 44, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hide for the and for joy thereof, go and sell all that he has and buys that field. So when it talks about the kingdom of heaven, it talks about what God is like. It's talking about how he does things. It's talking about his principles of how he rules and how he does things. And how he does things is that he finds a treasure in a field and sells all that he has to buy the field. And you are the treasure. Religion might have even perverted this verse and made it where you're the one that needs to sell all you have in order to obtain die and go to heaven. But that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about you are the treasure and God is the one that's willing to give all that he has just to have you. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man. You are not the merchant. He is seeking goodly pearls. And when he had found one pearl of great price, that's you, not God. It's not you're the merchant and God is the pearl. You're the pearl and God is the merchant. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. And so that's completely the opposite of demanding an oath of fealty and shut up and do what you're told. So we see, furthermore, what God's reign of dominion looks like, because it has nothing to do with putting his foot on your throat and demanding an oath of fealty and demanding subordination and shut up and do what you're told or else pay the price. So in Luke 6, starting in chapter 27, it says, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smites you on the one cheek, offer also the other. To him that take away your cloak, forbid not to take the coat also. Give to every man that asks of you, and of him that takes away your goods, ask them not again. Don't ask for him back. And as you would that men should do to you, you do also to them likewise. Golden rule. For if you love them which love you, and th what thank have you? For sinners also love those that love them. So is God's love for you only as weak as your love for him? Well, then that would be nonsensical because Jesus said, for sinners also love them that uh, love those that love them. What if it said, for if God only loves those which love him, what thank has he? For sinners also love those that love them. That would mean God is no better than, than, than anybody else. God's just as weak and impotent as you are in his ability to love you. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of who you hope to receive, what thank have you? For sinners also lend to sinners as, uh, to receive as much again. And so that's talking about lending for in order to make a profit. But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Well, that's completely the opposite of a tyrannical king. Be therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. And we discussed what mercy means. It means to give strength to the weak. It means to give help and to give comfort. It means to help the needy and to help the fatherless and the widows. Be therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. Judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgiven you shall be forgiven. And don't insert into the text what isn't there. That's what we're talking about. Don't say judge not and you shall not be judged by God. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned by God. Forgiven you shall be forgiven by God. It's by men. Judge not and you shall not be judged by others. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned by others. Forgiven you shall be forgiven by others. Given it shall be given to you by others. Okay, that's an insertion into the text of something that's not there to put God in there. 
Given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. It's actually in the text. It's actually in the text that it's people, not God. For with the same measure that you me uh, measure with all, shall it be measured to you again. And that was considered a new doctrine. So we end on Galatians chapter 6. And we see what kind of law that Paul thinks we're under. And it's this. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So what did Psalm 86 say mercy, mercy was? It was to give strength to those who are weak. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ.